On tonight's summary of the Israel-Hamas War, day 163, the Israeli delegation is going to arrive in Qatar on Monday to begin the next round of negotiations. The head of the Israeli Mossad was given parameters for what Israel is allowed to offer by Israel's war cabinet. The IDF carries out a raid in Al-Shifa Hospital in Gaza City. Gun battles are being reported in the compound. Growing reports that Marwan Issa, number three in the Hamas leadership in the Gaza Strip, was successfully assassinated last week. His body has yet to be recovered. The Islamic resistance in Iraq militia states that it carried out drone attacks against IDF bases in the Golan Heights. Former U.S. President Donald Trump calls upon Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu to finish the war up quickly and get back to the world of peace. Hello everyone, I'm Alon Burstein, visiting assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and Israel Institute Fellow at the University of California, Irvine, here bringing you the summary of the last 24 hours of the Israel-Hamas war. It is currently the evening of March 17, 2024 in the United States, the morning of March 18, 2024 in the Middle East. Starting with the hostage situation, in Israel, the War Cabinet and the Expanded Cabinet held meetings today with regards to the mandate that will be given to the Israeli delegation in order to negotiate in Qatar. The delegation is due to head to Qatar on Monday to begin negotiations. The head of the Mossad, Dedi Barnea, has been given the parameters by the War Cabinet, i.e. stating what is Israel allowed to offer in the negotiations and what are the limitations that Israel is not going to negotiate. As a reminder, according to where things stand right now, Hamas gave its answer after several weeks of delay to the latest summit, the, Paris, the second Paris summit, in Israel was stated that the Hamas demands are completely extreme and unacceptable. However, nonetheless, Israel is using this as a launching pad in order to begin negotiations in Qatar. It remains to be seen what is going to happen in the coming days if some breakthrough is achieved or if each side is still going to remain steadfast in its demands. Other news related to the hostage situation, the IDF announced today that another Israeli hostage, the IDF soldier Daniel Peretz, was in fact killed on October 7th, and his body was kidnapped back to the Gaza Strip and is currently held by Hamas. That brings the number of hostages that the IDF has confirmed are dead that are being held by Hamas to 35 out of the 134 hostages that are still in the Gaza Strip. And as a reminder, according to different reports, Israeli and U.S. intelligence may believe that another 20-odd hostages are in fact dead. Moving on to the Gaza Strip, there was a barrage of rockets sent from the Gaza Strip targeting the southern parts of Israel today. These target primarily, primarily the areas of Miflasim surrounding the Gaza Strip. Regarding the fighting in the Gaza Strip, the northern parts of the Gaza Strip in Gaza City, the IDF is carrying out a major raid into Al Shifa Hospital after it evacuated its forces from the hospital several months ago. The Hamas affiliated Shehab News Network reported that the raid began with a massive air and artillery bombardment around the hospital, and the IDF spokesperson then announced that IDF forces have entered the Al-Shifa following intelligence that senior Hamas officials who are, who are using the facility in order to manage and conduct terror operations are located in different parts of the hospital. The IDF announced that medical staff and patients are not being evacuated from the area, but there is a safe corridor for civilians to exit if they want to exit, and that the IDF, IDF is also sending in medical staff to assist the hospital in, as it continues to function. An hour into the raid, it was reported, and this I'll add is a few moments before recording this, that armed operatives opened fire onto the IDF soldiers from within the hospital, and gun battles are being reported in the area. But again, I will state, this is happening currently as I am recording this, so there will be more information about what actually happened in the hospital and how long this raid is going to take place tomorrow. Other news related to the north of the Gaza Strip, the Al-Quds Brigades, that is the military wing of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, put out several statements today, among others it stated that it carried out a sniping attack against IDF soldiers in the southwest parts of Gaza City, and that an IDF drone was shot down above Gaza City as it was gathering intelligence. In the central parts of the Gaza Strip, the largest tunnel located in the Gaza Strip thus far was detonated and destroyed by the IDF. According to reports, the tunnel was over two and a half kilometers long, connecting the northern parts of the Gaza Strip to the southern parts of the Gaza Strip, i.e. running under the Nitzarim or Nusirat corridor that the IDF is maintaining that essentially divides the Gaza Strip from north to south. Earlier in the day, Palestinian sources reported massive bombings in the northern parts of the Al-Nusirat refugee camp, so it is very possible this is very close to that border between the north and the south of the Gaza Strip, so it's possible the bombings that were reported were actually the detonations underground of this tunnel. Other bombings were also reported in the areas of Dir al-Balakh.
In the southern part of the Gaza Strip, in Han Yunus, despite eyewitness reports stating that the IDF was withdrawing from Hamid City, more IDF activity was reported in the region today, both by eyewitnesses on the ground, as well as by the IDF spokesperson. Gun battles were reported throughout the day in the area. The IDF reported targeting Hamas units loading weaponry onto a motorbike with an airstrike, successfully killing two Hamas operatives. Susp substantial artillery fire was also noted in the areas of El Karara and Azana. These are not in Hamid City, these are in the eastern part of Han Yunus. The IDF has been carrying out raids in the El Karara area. It is possible it is now expanding its raids towards the Azana region as well. Other news related to the Gaza Strip. There are growing reports that Marwan Issa was in fact successfully assassinated last week and that his body is still buried in the tunnel that was attacked. So as a reminder, it was reported on Tuesday this week that the IDF had carried out a bombing, uh, an attempted assassination of Marwan Issa in a tunnel in the central parts of the Gaza Strip between Saturday night and Sunday. However, it was not confirmed that he was in fact dead. IDF Chief of Staff Herzia Levy stated today that Hamas is going to great lengths to hide this fact that Marwan Issa is very likely already dead, and more evidence was also published throughout the day seemingly substantiating that Issa was in fact assassinated. Palestinian sources were quoted in the Sharq al Awsat confirming that Issa was in the tunnel when it was bombed. The Guardian also put out a report today stating that the encrypted messaging system that Hamas leaders used to communicate all went silent for 72 hours after the bombing in the tunnel. This is common practice when assassinations are carried out, since the group is not sure who may be receiving the messages as, or if the network was infiltrated. In addition, there was some report that stated that Hamas is concerned that the bodies of Marwan Issa and who was assassinated with him, Razi Abu Tama'a, who is the Hamas commander of the central camps, will be found in the tunnels by the IDF and then used in negotiations as part of the exchange of bodies, and Hamas's, and Hamas's desire to find these bodies first that is leading the group to delay its announcement that in fact Issa was killed. Regarding casualties, no IDF soldiers were reported killed or injured in the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours. This leaves the number of IDF soldiers killed in the Gaza Strip since the invasion began on 249, and the number of IDF soldiers injured in the Gaza Strip since the invasion began on 1,480. The Palestinian Health Ministry is reporting that 92 Palestinians were killed in the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours, bringing the total number of Palestinians killed in the Gaza Strip since the war began to 31,645. 73,676 Palestinians are reported injured in the Gaza Strip since the war began. Moving on to the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip, missions of para-dropping humanitarian aid were carried out again today in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip. Reportedly, there were joint operations including planes from Jordan, Egypt, the United States, and Germany that all dropped several tons of aid in the northern parts of the Strip. Other news, it was an interesting development reported in the last 24 hours with regards to the entrance of aid trucks to the Gaza Strip. After it was reported that 15 trucks delivering flour entered Gaza City late at night under the escort of massed and armed quote-unquote guarding units, the Saudi Asharic News Network quoted members of these units stating, I quote, the guarding units were established with the permission of the different factions and under national consensus of the Palestinians. They will protect the aid trucks from today to ensure they are not attacked or looted, end quote. The armed units were seen escorting the flower trucks and, s and stopping people from approaching them around the Nablusi Square in Gaza City, and the trucks were delivered to warehouses of UNRWA and welfare offices in Rimal. According to some estimates, these people may be affiliated with the Palestinian authorities, may be part of the, the special security forces of the Palestinian Authority that Israel is permitting to come into the Gaza Strip in order to maybe escort these trucks. The language was used in the statement stating that the, all the factions agree and is under, under national consensus also implies that this may be part of the Palestinian Authority. That is typical language that the Authority puts out when they say they do something. They say this is under the national consensus. It's just a different type of language that is used when Hamas or other factions use or put out statements. It remains to be seen who these units are. Presumably they're operating under the permission of the IDF as well, since the IDF also coordinates the security of the trucks, and these units could not have just all of a sudden started operating without the IDF at least being aware of them, if not agreeing to their presence. Other news related to the humanitarian situation, 19 humanitarian aid trucks reported they arrived in Jabalia refugee camp in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip. Earlier in the day, it was reported by local sources that 13 trucks managed to get to Gaza City and Jabalia refugee camp as well. It was not clear if these 19 were part, if the 13 were included in the 19, or if these were two separate shipments that managed to make it to the northern parts of the Gaza Strip. Other news, the EU commissioner stated today, in a meeting with Egyptian President Abdel Fattah Hassisi, that Gaza is under danger of famine and that an immediate ceasefire is critical. She also called for the release of hostages and allowing humanitarian aid into the Gaza Strip.
Moving on to the West Bank. After I reported yesterday about IDF activity that was, that was noted in Hebron, Yabed, and the Haisha refugee camp, the IDF reported that seven Palestinians were arrested in those various raids. I mention this because the Palestinian Prisoner Society reported that 20 Palestinians were arrested in the different raids. Sometimes the difference in the reports comes from different classification between if Palestinians were detained for questioning or if they were in fact arrested. Sometimes it is simply contradictory figures that are put out by both these agencies. However, the IDF report came out moments after I finished recording yesterday's report. Other news related to the West Bank. In an Israeli cabinet meeting today, Israeli Minister of National Security and head of the Jewish Power Party, Itamar Ben-Gvir, called upon Prime Minister Netanyahu to order the Defense Ministry to change policies in the West Bank, citing examples where Palestinian cars ride alongside Israeli cars due to a lack of manpower for checkpoints on the one hand, but citing that at the same time the IDF does find manpower to evacuate illegal outposts and unauthorized settlements that are established in the West Bank on the other. Relating to this issue of dismantling unauthorized settlements, that is, settlements that are established by Israelis in the West Bank, however, they do not have permission even by the Israeli government standards and le legal proceedings to establish these settlements, Israel's finance minister and head of the Religious Zionism party, Bezalel Smotrich, is reportedly trying to change the, change the chain of command, such that the IDF will not be the final authority on whether or not unauthorized settlements get dismantled, and instead it will be a citizen that is appointed by him, and he's reportedly trying to appoint a settler from the settlement of Itar to be in charge of this. Now, just a moment of clarification in order to explain why and how he's trying to do this, it's important to understand that Vitzal Smotrich is not only the finance minister in Israel, due to a coalition agreement that he has with Prime Minister Netanyahu from over a year ago, he is also a minister in the Ministry of Defense, so he's not the defense minister, but a minister within the Ministry of Defense, who is specifically in charge of the civil administration, putting him as the political figure in charge of the military regime in the West Bank. This puts him in the position to try to be the one who enforces what are the regulations that are imposed upon both Palestinians and Israeli settlers. Based upon this, he is trying to get more authorization to ensure that settlements are not dismantled in the future. This has put him in a lot of collisions with the defense ministry. It remains to be seen if this will actually happen. What is what is positive is that it is going to be a big headache for Prime Minister Netanyahu to try to reconcile both these approaches within his government. Moving on to the northern parts of Israel, southern parts of Lebanon, there were barrages of rockets and missiles sent from Lebanon targeting the northern parts of Israel today. These targeted the areas of Rajar, Hardov, there were also rockets sent towards Zarit, Shtuga, and Shomra, other barrages towards Evin Menachem, Hanita, Sasa, Matat, there was an anti-tank missile fired towards Metula as well. Hezbollah claimed responsibility for eight border incidents in addition to this, that is usually gunfire against IDF outposts along the border, and it also claimed artillery fire against cars in the areas of Kibbutz Malachia. Regarding IDF activity, IDF warplanes attacked Hezbollah military structures in the areas of El Hayam, as well as lookout posts in the Kila village. In addition, earlier in the day, the IDF stated that warplanes carried out four simultaneous attacks throughout southern Lebanon. These include targeting Hezbollah infrastructure and lookout posts in the areas of Iteron, a military structure in Alma Sha'ab, and lookout posts both in Meruhain and in Ita Sha'ab. Al Manar also reported that IDF artillery was carried out in the areas of Anakora. Artillery fire usually is responding to where rockets and missiles are launched from, and Anakora is an, uh, an area with a lot of launching sites, so it is very likely that is the source, at least, or the reason for that artillery fire. Moving on to some of the regional developments, the Jordanian army announced today that its air defenses identified a suspicious target flying along the Syrian border in a region close to the Israeli border as well. Warplanes reportedly scrambled to the area, and eyewitnesses stated there was a lot of aerial activity that was noted. Hours later, the Islamic resistance in Iraq militia stated that it attacked an IDF Air Force base in the Golan Heights with drones, stating that these attacks will continue during Ramadan out of support for Gaza. So it's not confirmed if what was reported by the Jordanian army is in fact uh, turned out to be the attack of the Islamic resistance in Iraq. The IDF made no mention of this attack. The, Jordan the Jordanian army is very sensitive to this because the attack that was carried out by now several weeks ago against the, the U.S. base Tower 22 that killed three U.S service people was actually done on Jordanian land and as a result Jordan is very very uh, is on very high alert with regards to any aerial activity coming from Syria or from Iraq Meanwhile, it was reported later in the evening that a suspicious aerial target crossed into Israeli airspace north of Eilat, this is the most southern part of Israel, likely launched by the Houthis, before crashing in the area. No reports were given, however, to confirm what in fact this was. All likelihood it was a drone that was sent by the Houthis in Yemen, however, remains to be seen. 
Moving on to the political and general trends for the last 24 hours and continued diplomatic escalations between the Biden admi administration and the Netanyahu-led government, Prime Minister Netanyahu seemingly answered the latest statements made by the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, who called for elections in Israel. I'll say, if you missed this, you can see details about Schumer's speech in my summary from March 14th on my channel. Netanyahu stated today in a government meeting, and I quote, in the international community, there are those who are trying to stop the war before achieving its aims, and they are doing that by leveling false accusations against the IDF, against the Israeli government, and against the Israeli Prime Minister. They do that by trying to bring us to elections now, in the middle of a war. After going on to equate elections at this time to Israel losing the war, he continued and vowed, and again I quote, We will not give up the, on these pressures. We will not surrender to them. Netanyahu also stated similar things in a CNN interview today, stating, If we have elections now before the war is won, and I mean res resoundly won, we would have at least six months of national paralysis, which means we would lose the war. If we don't win the war, we lose the war. Other political news, former U.S. President Donald Trump gave a Fox News interview today. Among others, he stated that the Democrats have dumped Israel and forgotten about October 7th. At the same time, however, when he was asked what would you say to Prime Minister Netanyahu, he said that he would call upon Netanyahu to finish the war quickly and get back to the world of peace because we need to be in a world of peace and we need peace in the Middle East, and he referenced the Abraham Accords as the way to achieve this. Other political news, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz is visiting Israel today. He met, among others, with Prime Minister Netanyahu, Israeli President Herzog, Minister Gantz, as well as the leader of opposition Lapid. In his concluding statement with Prime Minister Netanyahu, he stated that Israel has the right to defend itself from Hamas and the aims of the war are justified, but that the Palestinian civilians in Gaza cannot be ignored. He added that you cannot stand by and watch as civilians are starving, and that more needs to be done about this, stating that after five months it's time for an expanded hostage deal, adding, terror cannot be defeated solely by military force. Prime Minister Netanyahu stated that Israel is committed to re relieving the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip, however that the problem is that the aid is stolen by Hamas once it enters Gaza, and thus the responsibility for the situation lies with Hamas. As a political anecdote, I'll say that seemingly there was concern in Israel about Scholz's speech. According to reports, the Israeli Prime Minister's office initially cancelled the joint statements that were planned after the meeting, however later accepted Germany's demands that the statements be re-added and aired live. Another political news is ongoing and expanding protests in Israel, with family members of hostages and their supporters blocking highways at the entrance to the Knesset, calling upon the government to accept a hostage deal. This may become, imp become important for the way the war is run in the coming days, because in the coming days there is expected to be political developments in Israel, as, again, Minister Gidon Saar is demanding to join the war cabinet and stating he's going to leave the government. If that does not happen, whether that does happen or does not happen, likely he is going to relate to these demonstrations and try to build upon them in order to strengthen his message one way or another, and that is going to end up having some impact on what happens in the war and possibly on the hostage negotiations. If you enjoy these reports, please do remember to subscribe, give them a like, turn on notifications if you want to know when reports come out. If you have questions or comments, or if you'd like me to put out specific videos about specific topics, leave them in the comment section below. That is my report of the last 24 hours. I'll be back tomorrow.